Y'all doing good? Are y'all cold? Comfortable? Yes? Cold? Comfortable? All right. I'm cold. I'm, I'm going to push through it. Turn in your Bibles to the book of Philippians. The book of Philippians. Do what? Slap, Tiffany says slap, slap my stuff around. That's right. <laughs> the book of Philippians. One thing that's unique about this book is that Paul is writing to believers. And he's going to tell them things that they already know. And it's going to sound like he's saying the same things to them, but they're missing something. Something is not being connected in their minds and hearts. Um, There's a place that we're going to get to where two ladies have this big disagreement. Okay? Two ladies, and then Paul says they're believers. They're walking with them, serving with Paul. But there's a squabble. And it's big enough, must be epic enough, that it makes its way into the book of Philippians. This is in chapter 3. And so their squabble is enshrined in Scripture for everybody to read until Jesus comes back. They're missing something. They're two believers, but they're in conflict. There's friction there. And there's other places like that where they are, they're in sin, they're falling away, but they're true believers. And Paul, is, he wants to shed, shine a light and make some connections that they're not making with the gospel in their lives. So in this series, we've been showing how everything points to Jesus. And like everybody that has done with their book, we're in like an epistle. And with an epistle, it's Paul explaining, making the gospel connections, of how the gospel applies to their everyday life. Who likes the time change? Who likes the time change, like right now? Any, any, any weirdos in here? Where it gets dark at four? You know, it's 10 o'clock. No, it's four o'clock. I hate that. And so we're like, we're in a new house, and Tiffany's junk is still everywhere in the house. So I just, for <laughs> shock value. There's boxes, our boxes. I share the problem. But if it's dark, I'm stumbling around. I, we lived nine years at the old house. I can walk in the dark and know where everything is in this new house, I need the lights to cut on. And it made me think about, like, when you become a believer, you're, well, first of all, you're, you're like a house. You're like a dark house. And when God saves you, the Spirit cuts the light on. Okay, He turns the light on. He, he shows you that God is holy, you're sinful, and why you need Jesus. There's a light on. But through his providential process, more lights need to be cut on. The light, the Holy Spirit turns the lights on, but not all the lights are on in every room. And so that's what sanctification is. Sanctification is taking the gospel and wiring and turning the lights on in every other room, in all the rooms. So we're going to get into it. Let me pray, and then we'll get started. Lord, we thank you again for your word. Thank you for Philippians. We thank you for uh, the light of the gospel. We pray that you would help us to apply this to our hearts and our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so Philippians, we show why he wants us to, why he wrote this book. He wants the original readers in us to understand the gospel doesn't just get us into the kingdom but gets the kingdom into us. Okay? He wants us to see that uh, the gospel is not just the power of God to salvation, but also to sanctification. Look at, verse, uh, look at uh, Philippians 1.9. Philippians 1.9. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure, blameless for the day of Christ. Deal with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. 
So this is like his thesis statement for why he wrote this book to the Philippians. And if you've ever wondered, well, he, this is like their mail. This is the Philippians' mail. Like, why are we reading and saying we have to follow their mail? Paul wrote these letters. They would take these letters and they would s copy them and, and read them to all the churches in the area. That's why we have so many copies today of the book of Philippians, Galatians, Romans. And while we can see and, and check and make sure everything is reliable and trustworthy, they made copies and they read this. So this is applicable for us. He's writing to Philippians directly, but also us indirectly and applies to us. So let's work through this passage. Verse 9, Paul wants us to abound in love. And not just like a dim kind of love, but he wants us to abound in love, an excessive amount of just love, um, overflowing love for each other. And not like a, a dumb love where I'm like, I just love because I'm, you know, but love with knowledge, L knowledge of the gospel. And not just knowledge, but knowledge of who Jesus is and what he came to do, but wisdom. The ability to use that knowledge with discernment, applying the gospel to your life. And again, like my leading off ex example, these two ladies, they love Jesus. They love Paul. But there's something missing. There's some, they're missing this gospel connection that is not allowing their differences to be dissolved and, and create peace in their relationship. So for this reason, verse 10, so that you may approve what is excellent and be pure, blameless for the day of, of, of Christ, so that you may know how to live in a way that honors King Jesus. Verse 11, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Christ Jesus. Again, the gospel is the power of God for sanctification. In all of this, the ultimate purpose, verse 11, is to bring glory and praise to the Lord. This is why you exist. You exist to bring honor and praise to the glory of the Lord. Again, how can two spirit-filled believers be in such conflict? What are they missing? Some lights are not working. Look at Philippians 3.1. I write these thing, same things to you, and it's no trouble to me, and it's safe for you. Okay, so he's calling the believers. I'm just trying to let you know that they are believers, okay? He's calling the brothers, and he's telling them stuff they've already, they already know, okay? But they're misapplying it. So tonight we're going to look at some of those dark rooms and see how Paul turns the lights on. Here's some places, here's some things that they were struggling with that he wants to address. Number one, arrogance. They're arrogant. Number two, they're grumbling and disputing with one another. Number three, there's a need to repent of their righteousness, which may, may sound strange, but we're going to get to that. And number four, the need for perseverance to the glory of God. So these are dark rooms. Again, they're believers. But there's, there's lights that need to come on in their hearts and lives. Philippians 1, 27, Paul talks about the importance of how they live. How they live matters. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel. He wants them to be mature, to bring honor and glory to, to Jesus. He wants to live in unity, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being full of, of accord of the same mind. So he, like, Paul tethers his joy in their growth. He's like, complete my joy. I, I, have, I have skin in the game. I want you to mature. I want you to use your life for the honor and glory of the Lord. Complete my joy. But here's the problem. So, Philippian Baptist Church is selfish, is conceited, always talking about people, putting them down, assuming the worst. Oh, they know the Bible, but it's only to show that they're the smartest person in the room. They're not walking in step with the gospel. And what does Paul say? Philippians 2.3, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his, your own interests, his own interests, but also the interests of others. So arrogance. The first light fixture that he needs to wire up is a need for 
humility. So the selfish ambition he talks about is, I'm, I'm going to define it as building your own kingdom, seeking to promote yourself, selfish ambition, and also conceit, excessively proud of oneself, vain, narcissistic, looking in the mirror and saying, I'm the best, and I want everybody to know that I am. There were some that were building their own kingdom and wanted everyone to know about it and possibly even use their Christianese, Christian, Christianity as a way to promote themselves. They were doing it for the likes and followers to promote themselves. And he wants to shed light on this, pot, this pattern in their life. So what does he do? What aspect of the gospel does Paul use to turn the light on? He could, he could use the second commandment. Hey, love your neighbors yourself. Y'all are forgetting the second commandment. It's, it's, being arrogant is not loving your neighbor. But he doesn't use the law because it's not the power of God to salvation. 2 Corinthians 5.14 says, the love of Christ compels us. The love of Christ controls us. It pushes us forward to true lasting change from the heart level. So what does Paul do to promote repentance from arrogance and promote humility? Surprisingly, and this is timely because we're just singing about it, he points to the incarnation. He reminds them of the, well, first of all, what's the incarnation? Somebody. I've been monologuing so long, I'm asking you questions now. What's the incarnation? Yeah, God come to us. God come to this earth in human form. That's right. So the problem is arrogance. He wants to promote humility, and he's like, I don't know, the incarnation. What did Jesus do? He's glorious. He's infinite in glory. And and what did he do? Let's, Let's think about it. He reminds them of the humble status that God took to love others. And and so Paul's like, think about these things. He's he's directing their minds before before the actions come. Look at this verse. Look at Jesus. Uh, This is Philippians 2, 5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being found in human likeness, in the, in the, found in the likeness of man, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death, on the cross. So Paul says, have, have this mind among yourself. Change your actions by having the mind of Jesus. This is the mindset that Jesus had in his mission and ministry. Look at verse 6. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Or another translation says, or a thing to be held onto for advantage. Verse 6, he did not count equality with God. He is equal with God. Okay, He didn't lose his godness. He is equal with God. But it says Jesus didn't count it. He didn't count it. Now, I've got different ways to try to break that down of what that means. What does it mean he didn't count this? He did not put that glory on the scale when he was measured. He didn't play that card in his hand, the glory card. He didn't leverage his cosmic creator power as a way to rise above in the world and one-up people or gain influence. He is the creator that came into creation but got ignored and abused. He has like the affinity stones of power, able to bend time and space, but he sleeps under a bridge. He took the back seat on the way to do the grunt work. Jesus took on a new kind of glory in his humility. And Paul says, this is the mindset. You're you're struggling with arrogance. You're thinking too highly of yourself. Have the mindset of Jesus. A relentless humble servant, loving God and loving people. Like, people can put on a face, like, I can put up with you for so long, and 
Okay, it's over. You know, I can, I can go home, whatever. Jesus stayed the course by loving us. He didn't just grin and bear it for a little bit, but his whole heart was in loving you to life. Jesus, think about this. Jesus takes off the robe of glory so that when he puts it back on, you have one as well. Isn't that good? And verse 9 reminds us that he does indeed have that glory back on because he has ascended back to the Father. You look at verse 9. Jesus is equal with God, but during his ministry, you wouldn't know it unless he showed you. And he does show them in places. Isaiah 53.1 says, it prophesies about the hum, uh, humility of Jesus. He had no beauty. This is what Isaiah 51, 53, 1 says. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. This doesn't mean that Jesus was unattractive, but it simply means that we would not be drawn to him because of some theophanic glory or him being in, in trans, uh, transfiguration form. When you saw Jesus, you would see a humble servant on his way to Jerusalem. Have this mind in you, Paul says. This is the mindset that Jesus had. A humble servant's heart, seeking to serve others in saving them, build them up for the glory of God. Again, the problem with arrogance is the solution is repent and believe the gospel. Look at Jesus again. Look at what he's done for you. Paul wants us to ask ourselves, why am I seeking to take the form of a king when Jesus took the form of a servant? If Jesus took the mindset of a servant, who am I to take the mindset of a king and act like that? Does that make sense? Have this mind among you, Paul says. So Paul uses the gospel to spur them on to humility. Paul doesn't just use lawful blunt force or his apostolic power to promote change. He wants to get them at the heart level. Second thing, the grumbling and disputing. This is Philippians 2.14. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God. So Paul reminds them that they are indeed children. So how is Paul going to deal with this one? How is he going to turn the lights on in this room where there's grumbling and disputing going on? He reminds them that they're children of God. Children born again of God don't act like this very long. He wants, him, he wants to make the connection with the truth that, first of all, he wants us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling like we see in verse 12 and verse 13. For it's God who works in you both to do uh, uh, for his good pleasure. This working out is not in a justification sense because this passage comes after the therefore in verse 12. This working out is a sanctification sense. He wants them to make these gospel connections to turn the lights on. So there's grumbling, disputing, and he wants them to wrestle with the truth of the gospel in in iron out these and repent of these sins of grumbling and complaining. So let me just define this. Grumbling is unhappy with the decisions or how things are going. The root of grumbling is this disbelief in the goodness and promises and timing of God. And to attack this, Paul points them to another gospel truth that they are children of God. And think about this. If they're children of God, they're heirs of God. They, when, in time, we inherit the world. So rest on these things. Stop this grumbling, complaining about how things are going now. You, because of the gospel, inherit the earth. Think about these things. Use, again, have this mind in you. Use your mind. God is your Father, and you lack no good thing. So stop complaining. Stop the grumbling. Second thing, they're, this d disputing, they're arguing, um, discussing, uh, heated dis discussions. Again, this is not like, it's not wrong to argue or debate. You need to give reasons for why you believe something or not believe something. There must have been something unbiblical and sinful about this dispute. Again, we see the two ladies called out in chapter 3. 
Um, chapter 3, verse 2, Paul says, I entreat, um, I butchered this, okay, Judea. Okay, there's more vowels and consonants in her name. So there we go. That might, that might have been the, the, the conflict starting there. Judea, and I entreat Judea, and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are written in the book of life. So, like I said at the beginning, their, their squabble must have stayed long enough and lingered long enough prison, by the way, and he has to address it because it's big enough that he needs to call them out by name and address this. Agree in the Lord. So, and if I'm sure if Paul talked to these ladies, they would probably say, well, you don't know what she's done to me. And she, the other one would probably say, I'm, I can't stand her. Um, we're done. And um, does Paul say, just suck it up? This is a bad look for Philippian Baptist Church. We can't be having this. He doesn't say that. What does Paul appeal to to get them to create peace? They don't have to be BFF, but they're, come on, let's work things out here. Paul appeals to the common ground as a starting place for reconciliation. He points them to the root in order to grow the fruit. This common ground they have. He says, ladies, you need to agree in the Lord. You have peace and a restored relationship with God through Jesus. That's your common ground. That's what you can both agree on. All these other differences, you can at least agree on that, start from that place and move forward. If you have peace with God, how can you not have peace with one another? Your record of wrongs was deleted on the cross. It's arrogant and prideful to think that you can keep a record of wrong against each other. That's Paul's direct admonition to these girls. Agree in the Lord. Start from that common ground. And what does he say to everyone else in this letter? Verse 3, help these women. Don't just like catfight. Don't just stand beside and watch this happen. Help these women make these connections. Help them make the connection like Paul is doing in this letter. He's helping them make a connection to see how to apply the gospel to their, to their hearts and to the situation they have. The third room Paul wants to bring light into is our standing before the Lord, our justification. So three, he wants them to see their need to repent of their righteousness. Their righteousness. Philippians 3.2 says, Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God, the glory and glory in Christ Jesus, who put no confidence in the flesh. The flesh here is your ability to do, to please the Lord by your good works. Who are these people that, he's, that Paul's talking to? Are they lawless pagans? Evil doer, evil doers. He calls them evil doers. Here's who they are. They're, they're squeaky clean, law-keeping Judaizers, fine upstanding citizens. But all they're doing is saying, yes, Jesus, plus this little bit of law-keeping. Yes, Jesus, but you need to do this as, as well if you're going to have a right standing with the Lord. These evildoers, as Paul says, they're not just flat out denying Jesus. It's too obvious. It's subtle. It's Jesus plus something you do. And Paul says that's evil. Look what Paul says in Philippians 3.3. Glory in, in Christ Jesus. Put no confidence in the flesh. So put no confidence in your ability to please the Lord. For your justification and your continued justification for the Lord. It's all Christ. It's all the gospel. It's not what you do. Verse 4, though I myself have reason for confidence. He's like, You've, you're trying this? I've been there. It's not going to go well. 
you're going to find yourself not holding the standard. Though I myself have reason for confidence, verse, this is uh, Philippians 3, 4, in the flesh also, if anyone thinks that he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the, of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. So he's like, um, you're falling short of my standard. <laughs> this is what I did. I can trace my lineage uh, back to the tribe of Benjamin. I'm the Hebrew of Hebrews. I'm a Pharisee. Now, I don't just sit on my tail as an armchair theologian. I have zeal. I persecuted the church. That's where I'm at. You're falling short of my standard. <laughs> Think about this. If Jesus is your law keeper, there's no room for your law keeping as you, to offer to the Lord. If Jesus fulfilled the law, there's not a place to put your law keeping. If it's fulfilled, if something is fulfilled, you can't put anything else in it. It's full. It's done. All the check marks have been checked off. It's done. Paul says, I've been there seeking to establish my own righteousness before the Lord, and I fell short of that standard. This is what he says, verse 7, But whatever gain I had, whatever I thought I was doing in all this, I counted it as loss for the sake of Christ. So the thing that I was doing, contributing to, it actually was not helping me. It was hindering, it was a, a roadblock before the Lord. Indeed, I count everything a loss. It's not just like neutral, but actually detracting from away from Jesus. I count everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For His sake I've suffered the loss of all things. I count them all as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in Him not having a righteousness of my own. Again, they were probably trying to do the opposite if he's saying this in here. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes through the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith. So think about this. There's two ways to get to God. Be, for, be perfect and fulfill the law. The formula is simple. Law plus obedience equals righteousness. Law. Be perfect, be holy as God is holy. Then you try to do that. If you're perfectly holy as God is holy, you, you earn a righteousness, a right standing before the Lord. We can't do that. And God's not going to lower His standard uh, because we're handicapped because of Adam. His, his standard is perfection. But God has provided a way for us to keep that commandment. Jesus kept the law by His obedience. Like we talked about a second ago, He earns for us a righteousness on our behalf. Jesus earns it so that we can take it freely. How do you receive this gift of righteousness that He earns for us? How, I'm asking a question. How, how do we receive this righteousness? The righteousness we need to stand before the Lord. What's the word? How do we take a hold of this? Believe. Believe. Another, sin, another word for faith. Thank you. Believe. We're putting our hope and trust in Jesus. Faith informs, I kind of mentioned this in Sunday school, faith informs our repentance. And repentance informs our faith. If you're looking to Jesus... You're not looking to anything else. If your faith, if, if Jesus is the object of your faith, you're not looking to anything else to save you. If Jesus is the object of our faith, then we repent of everything that's not Jesus, including our righteousness. Even our love for Jesus falls short of the glory of God. If you struggle with, uh, with am I a Christian or am I not, Look to Jesus, okay? Don't look to your level of love that ebbs and flows that's never up to the right standard to really love Him enough. If I hit the standard to say, yes, uh, you're accepted. 
We put our faith in His love for us, not in our love for Him. So think about like, think product and byproduct, okay? The Spirit produces faith. We see that in the Philippians, uh, not Philippians, uh, Ephesians 2.9. Faith is a gift that is given freely from the Lord. Faith is the product, okay? It's a thing that's produced by the Spirit. Love, the love you have for Jesus is a byproduct of that. It's a byproduct of the gift of faith. So we're not looking at the byproduct to say, am I saved or not? We're looking to the object of our faith. Jesus, not our love for Jesus. My love for Jesus is not the object of my faith. Paul says that obviously we should love Jesus. That's the fruit of faith. Faith is the fruit, sorry, faith is the root. Love is the fruit. If you're looking for a good tattoo slogan, there you go. Faith is the root. Love is the fruit that comes from that which God gives us. Our faith is not in our ability to love Jesus. Our faith is in Jesus' ability to love us. Do y'all see the difference? You don't? I can flesh this out later. It's not our love that holds on to Him. It's His love that holds on to us. Fourth, Fourth thing that he wants to tackle, our need to persevere in hope. Philippians 3, verse 12, Not that I've already obtained it, or I'm perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Verse 13, Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing that I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. Again, think. All throughout this book, he's like, think about it. Think this way. And if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal it to you also. Skip back to Philippians 1.20. Again, I want us to hit this perseverance and hope theme. Philippians 1.20, it says, That is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. So contrast what he says. So like, to live is Christ, to die is gain. If I live, it's for Jesus. If I die, more Jesus. It's gain because I get to see Jesus. So contrast that, that lifestyle, that mindset, with this nihilistic, hopeless prophets of the day. Let me give you an example. So this is a, this is a line from a popular song. This is a, from a Lincoln Park song. And again, you, you hear this, and it comes from a heart that is coming to a realization that there's nothing to really live for. There's, there's no ultimate hope. There's ultimate, no, no big plan. I tried so hard, and I got so far, but in the end, it doesn't even matter. This is Lincoln Park in the end. I tried so hard, I got so far, but in the end, it doesn't matter. I had to fall to lose it all, but in the end, it doesn't even matter. This song is a popular lament of the reality of a life without the light of the gospel lighting up somebody's soul. Their house is always dark. They're grasping at their earthly glory and riches and relationships. They're obtaining it in some way But in the end, it just turns to dust. In the end, it doesn't even matter. And we're we're wired for great expectations. We have a soul hunger to see glory and to know a love that doesn't fade. And here's Paul. To live is Christ and to die is gain. 
to contrast what we just read. And you can read, you can see all kind of other messages all throughout the world right now. But Paul says to live as Christ and to die as gain, which is a unique message only Christians can have. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ. My goal is to know Jesus and make Him known. Paul, if you go there, they're going to kill you. They kill me, I get to see Jesus. But if I'm alive and somehow survive, and he, he, he went through the torture, if you read his epistles, if I survive, it's more labor for Jesus. Is the gospel generating a hope like that for you in your life right now? Or are you coasting? Are you like, you coming in here, are you engaging with your mind in making those gospel connections so that you're like Paul? Like, I'm living for Jesus. I'm not going to live for myself and build my own kingdom here on earth. I'm going to live for the Lord. Have you, has that, have you made it personal? Like Paul says, think about these things. In other words, make it personal. Is the light on in your heart? So the fifth light that Paul wants to turn on is peace for life. Jesus said, in this life you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. He says this in Matthew 16, verse 33. We will have trouble, okay? It's not if, but when. Are you going to dread it when you get that bad phone call? Are you, is that how you're going to live? Paul's like, we're not going to live like that. And here's the reason why. Let's just, Philippians 4.4, 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. There's a lot of repetition. It's like, I've already re- written you this. Again, I say rejoice. Like, you need to be reminded of these truths. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. But in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So all throughout this letter, he turns the lights on by giving us truth for our minds. Don't just blindly follow, but engage. Make the connections. And this is not like voodoo Peace. Like, I've, I've been in a church where <laughs> uh, the pastor's like, just say the name. Jesus. And we're just saying the name. Like an incantation. Like, without explaining why Jesus, it makes no sense. It's just saying words. Paul says, use your brain. See the light. Use your brain to cut on the light. Because of who Jesus is and what he's done, you'll be happy forever, no matter what. The gospel is how we guard our hearts and minds and keeps us rejoicing. And we can have this peace now by faith. So in conclusion, the Philippians are believers. He's given us reasons to say that they are believers. Paul says they are. He's an apostle, so we're going to believe him. The lights are on in the house, but not in every room. And that's the same with us. Okay? They're still working out their salvation they have in Jesus by applying the gospel to their pro- sins and to their problems. Are you an arrogant person? If you, again, if, if, we, if you thought, when I was covering that, if you thought about somebody else, you're an arrogant person. Okay? So, just so you know. Repent by looking to the truth that Jesus humbled himself to serve to seek the good of those who didn't deserve it. Do you have something against another believer? If there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, again, why is there condemnation between the two of you? If you have peace with God, there should be peace in your relationship. Fighting against sin, persevere. Jesus has made you His own. He wants you to be with Him. It's what we just read about. God's love is not a sterile, but it's passionate. 
Persevere by looking to His love for you in the Gospel. And persevere with the peace of God. The lights come on when we make the Gospel connection. Paul wants us to think have you made, have you have the same mind of Jesus? Paul wants uh, them to see the beauty and goodness of Jesus. He wants them to see that the gospel doesn't just get you into the kingdom, but gets the kingdom into you. The Christian life is really simple. It's just repent and believe. It's take the gospel light into further areas of your heart, further areas of your house, and light those rooms. Make those... In, but it's, it's wrestling. How do I do that? And again, that's why, we're, that's why we're here tonight. That's why you have good gospel relationships and, and we talk about these things. We sin because we fumble the gospel. We sin because we forget the gospel. We forget how good Jesus is and we tend to go to something else at that moment and we sin. So what do we need? We just need to just need to straight up. We don't need that. Be reminded. We need to be reminded of how good Jesus is. To move our heart to some lasting change. And that's what Paul's trying to do here. We sin when the gospel gets dim, when those lights that, that are on in your heart, because you're a believer, and these again he's talking to believers, it dims, it fades a little bit. And Paul says, No, don't do that. Think again. The power source that the uh, the power source is always there. Tap into it in the gospel. Paul labors here in this letter to show that the gospel is the power of God to salvation and sanctification. He's telling them things they already know, but maybe blind to how to apply the gospel further. So, last thing: Are you applying the gospel to your heart? Do you see the gospel like this, like we? Tiffany and I have a friend. Um, she's a believer from all I understand. And she was going through some things. And I was like, hey, I, I, at this point, it sounds like you're just not applying the gospel. Like you're not believing that Jesus is who he says he is in this area of, of your life. Like, believe the gospel. In her mind, like, the gospel is just like how you get in. Like, I'm a Christian. Like, I'm questioning her salvation. I'm not questioning her salvation. I'm just saying, like, you're not applying the gospel here. Like, Paul's, if you read this book, and I'm just hitting the highlights here, he's constantly going back to the gospel for believers. And that's what this, this friend that Tiffany and I had, she was missing that key thing. She thought the gospel got us in, and now we do something other than the gospel to grow in the Christian life. And she's missing that key thing. But you see here in Paul's epistles, he's constantly, there's a problem he addresses, and he constantly goes back to the gospel to solve that, that problem, to produce a lasting change. Because what else is he going to do? Is he a life guru? And, well, st stats say this, and if you don't do this, then your kids are not going to turn out great or whatever. But then that stat or that guru gets the glory. God gets the glory. God gets the glory in the gospel when you use the gospel for a gospel transformation. Are you working? Are you wrestling in your personal life? Are you working through the implications of the gospel in your own life? I, I pray that what I said tonight <clears throat> would give you a lot to think about and that these examples are like a framework of how you should see the gospel in your own life. Like Paul says, have this mind in you like that of Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you again for your word. We thank you that your scriptures point us to Jesus in every book. And we thank you that, that the Gospels show forth the one that the, the Old Testament points to and that you've, you've accomplished the only work that, that, that you could do, that we couldn't do, by dying for us, living the perfect life, and then dying for us on the cross. And now, that, thank you for these epistles that break that down to show how that 
the gospel gets us into the kingdom and gets the kingdom into us and how it works out and, and permeates and penetrates in every area of our lives. We pray that you would cut the lights on, Holy Spirit. Only you can do that. So we pray that you would uh, bless these students and help these students to pray that more of the lights would come on for them and for us as we continue growing in our sanctification for your honor and your glory. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen.